Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for another NetHope Solution Center webinar. Today our topic is secure and optimize your global WAN with CenturyLink Adaptive Network Security. This webinar is hosted by NetHope's Connectivity and Infrastructure Working Group and we're welcoming speakers from CenturyLink today. Before we get started, like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for today's session. Please keep this session interactive. We'd like you to post any questions or comments in the Zoom chat window for our Q&A session toward the end of the hour. Please also look for a follow-up email which will include a link to the recording of this webinar and any collateral um, of the presentation slides. And we also encourage you to complete our webinar satisfaction poll that will pr be presented after the webinar. It helps us um, get feedback from you and uh, make these sessions better every time. And with that, I will hand it off to my colleague Duncan Drury, who will introduce our speakers for today and pr present you with a little more context for today's session. Duncan? Thanks, Thanks very much, Madeline. Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, humanitarian development NGOs all depend very much on their internet connections to communicate between files, field sites spread around the world. Like any complex WAN, there are challenges in securing and managing many locations. Traditionally, this has required firewall and VPN hardware at each location. For NetHope members and others in this space, the complex geographies pose an additional set of challenges. CenturyLink have a new approach which takes advantage of the cloud and their super fast backbone network. I'm very excited to, uh, to have Saad and Graham from CenturyLink here today who are going to run through the, this solution with you. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to learning a lot. So over to you, Graham and Saad. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, so this is Sal Hack from CenturyLink. Um, first things first, can I just check you can hear me loud and clear? Yes, indeed, we can. Fantastic, thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so I guess just a quick introduction. So SoundHack's uh, security sales specialist here at CenturyLink. Um, we're here to talk to you about securing and optimizing your, your global wide area network. Uh, with a product set that we have called Adaptive Network Security. I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Graham Smith, who's Head of Security Solutions. Um, the agenda for today is really going to be a little bit around um, conscious, uh, a lot of people on the call, uh, if they're outside the United States, may not be familiar with our, with our brand. So I'm just going to give a, a high level overview of who we are. Um, why we are doing what we do in the security space and in the wide area networking space, um, how we do it and, and what we do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit around the sort of business challenges that organizations uh, face uh, in the general enterprise space, but also uh, specific to NGOs. Um, give a little bit of a view of the threat landscape and what we see. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit around uh, the product overview and give you um, some examples where Graham will talk you through sort of typical de deployments and use cases. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. So uh, let me know if there's any problems there, Madeline and Duncan. Looks good. Fantastic. Great. So, um, okay, so the first sort of next 20, 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to run you through, um, as I say, just give a, a quick high level introduction to, to CenturyLink and who we are. Um, a lot of uh, people on the call, I'm sure in the United States would be familiar with our brand. Obviously, we're a, we're a fairly well known household consumer brand. We provide services in, uh, into, into homes and, and, and mediums and small offices around broadband and cable tele telephones and, 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 uh, and, and so forth. Um, however, our, our business is significantly wider than that. Um, and really it's, it's, it's due to a um, number of acquisitions and, and evolution of the company over a significant period of time. But just to give you sort of a high level overview of who we are, I mean, CenturyLink actually have very humble origins based back in 1930s. Uh, U.S. Uh, in, in the southern states where we were uh, essentially a, 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 local, uh, a local carrier of, of, of telco services um, and the company grew very much organically for, for many, many decades. 
It wasn't really till in the late 80s that the company rebranded from Central Telephone Company to CenturyTel, and it, and it embarked on a series of acquisitions um, in the 2000s, uh, starting with Embark. Uh, it rebranded as CenturyLink in around about uh, 2010, and it made a, a couple of significant acquisitions, uh, one being Quest, which was uh, former Southwest Bell, um, and Savis, which are a major co-location and managed hosting provider. So the actual focus of the organization moved away from just uh, the consumer branch and small businesses to, to large enterprise and, and to a wider uh, portfolio of, of managed hosting services. Um, over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so, there have been some very significant acquisitions um, ranging from other cloud hosting companies to data analytics companies to security, cybersecurity organizations, um, culminating in late 2017 with the acquisition of Level 3 Communications. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Level 3 Communications brand, uh, perhaps in, uh, in, in Latin America and, and uh, in Europe, in EMEA, um, partly because we are a significant player of business services. And Level 3 itself had a significant uh, history and story behind its uh, conception. It was born out of the uh, drive in the late 90s and the dot-com boom to build IP global backbones. Uh, the business uh, raised 14 billion on the capital markets in the late 90s and essentially built lay submarine cable systems and, and owned and managed a fiber backbone. Its business model being selling originally to wholesale carriers in, in, in country um, telcos to get data across the globe. Um, it, it itself went through several acquisitions, uh, Global Crossing, Time Warner Telecom, um, so it, it in itself was a significantly large organization. So the combination of CenturyLink as being a domestic uh, carrier within the United States and Level 3 having a significant global footprint means that we have a significantly large organization with 50,000 plus employees. We operate in 60 plus countries, as in we have offices, um, but we serve a significantly uh, larger number of, uh, of countries as well, uh, where we don't have individuals, but we do provide connectivity solutions. And the company is uh, hovering around about 23 billion in revenue now. Most of that revenue is actually, is business orientated, uh, serving our business markets. The consumer branch of our business is only about 20, 20 percent. Uh, of which yeah, 80% is, is predominantly enterprise in government. So just to give you a little bit of a scope in terms of the scale of the business, uh, I talked very much about our global fiber optic um, network that most of it was, was built um, to serve the uh, transformation of organizations in, into the digital economy. We now own around about 450,000 miles of root, uh, routes of fiber. We have over 150,000 directly connected buildings, um, which gives us a lot of control. Um, as I say, we serve over 60 uh, customers in over 60 plus countries. Um, and we do have a significant consumer base in, in the United States. So CenturyLink now has a very, very broad, broad portfolio of services. Typically, a lot of organizations or a lot of people have a, uh, a kind of preconception that perhaps we're a uh, a, a provider of uh, home broadband service to the United States in, in outside of the international, in the international arena organizations see us as a networking provider, a data networking provider. And, and that is true to a certain extent. We do come from a very much a data networking background, but we've come to realize that our data network actually gives us a phenomenal amount of visibility. And we have a whole pillar within our go-to-market strategy, which covers security. And our strategy really is to become the trusted connection to the network world. And this has been driven out of a number of business challenges that our customers talk to us about. So moving on to sort of business challenges that what we're seeing, and this you know, goes across all kinds of businesses and governments, including, including NGOs, but the, 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 the trends that we've been seeing is network growth, the amount of data being created, the number of devices joining the internet every day, the trends that organizations are seeing where users need to access data, not just from uh, defined offices, but on the go through multiple devices. Uh, we've been seeing the advent of 5G uh, and also the transformation of how uh, organizations consume data in the cloud. Workloads are, are 
transferring to the cloud at a ever evolving and, and rapid, a rapid pace. Um, what we're also seeing um, is a significantly evolving threat landscape. There's very, very rarely a week goes by where an organization isn't affected um, either through uh, business availability or the confidentiality or integrity of their data. Um, cyber criminality is uh, increasing due to the barriers of entry declining. Um, threats are pr proliferating. Uh, you have a whole host of different kinds of bad actors out there, everyone from hacktivists who don't like a specific organization for some political reason to uh, lone wolves. But then going further up the chain, you have or more of an evolution of um, cyber criminality, um, as well as nation states who could be behind some of these, um, these, these attacks that organizations are facing. The other, other areas that we're seeing organizations struggling with is the complexity. So the, the, the complexity is driven by the fact that data is becoming more dispersed, the way people access data, um, as well as the evolving threat landscape has, me, has meant that organizations are typically buying more and more security equipment and services, and, and that is causing more of a headache in terms of being able to manage those complex security environments. Organizations need to be able to stitch these environments together um, and you know come out with a good business outcome so typically we're finding organizations turning to managed security providers to help them with that journey the other area that we find an organizations typically complain about is there is a significant talent challenge out there when it comes to security operations there just doesn't there just isn't the talent um, to fill the roles um, uh, or keep people within the role for long enough um, there are around about a million cybersecurity or security operational roles vacant today around the globe, and that is predicted to rise to about three, um, three million by the end of the decade. So I talked a little bit some of the trends, but um, we need to focus a little bit around the service offering that we're going to talk to you about today, and, and that is um, what we call our adaptive network security offering. We built that product um, around a specific need or some specific needs that our customers were, were talking to us about and what we're seeing in the wider space. There's two main digital trends that we're seeing here. One is the advent of uh, organizations moving away from head offices or remote offices where they have mobile workers on the road accessing data and, and applications from multiple devices. Those devices need to be protected. The other big trend obviously is accessing data away from your traditional co-location environment where you knew where the data was stored in a specific server uh, which was running a specific application those workloads have, have moved very much into into shared environments and we're finding that we're getting to that 50 percent mark where workloads almost 50 percent of workloads are now sitting in 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 cloud environments such as aws azure and so forth so address, to address these trends it has had a significant impact in terms of how customers are designing their networks going forward. So I talked a little bit about what CenturyLink has in its portfolio and, and what we can provide our customers. Obviously, organizations see us as a, as a data networking company and absolutely that's our, 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 our traditional um, foundations as, a, as, a, as an organization. We provide a whole host of services from um, Internet services, managed internet services, managed wider uh, networks, MPLS, SD, SD-WAN services, bringing together mobility um, and securing our, our customers who have significantly large mobile workforces. We then do um, what we call IT agility, which is essentially everything from dedicated environments for your IT um, requirements, co-location or, or managed hosting, right up to understanding how workloads are consumed and understanding where running best execution venues for uh, helping customers understand where they can run workloads in the cloud. All of these environments need to be securely connected and that's our third pillar we call connected security. We have a, we have a, a whole host of solutions, um, one of which we will talk to you about today. So coming back to who we are and, and you know, why would you trust a network company? So ultimately we have 450,000 root miles of fiber. We have uh, a very significant amount of on net buildings. We also have a significant amount of peering. So I talked a little bit around 
our level three acquisition uh, around two and a half years ago. The, the level three network, um, which is our sort of go-to-market wide area network, is one of the most interconnected, hyper-connected uh, networks on the planet. Uh, if you look at a lot of third parties, the results that come out of the research institutes, the level three business, because of its business model in the, in the early 2000s, selling to other carriers, put us in a very significant position. And it means that we see a significant amount of internet traffic. It also um, has been built where we peer as locally as possible to customers uh, and other ISPs. We, we peer with more other ISPs than anyone else out there. Um, and that means that we can give our customers a very significantly improved internet experience. There are less hops, means that you can get to the assets where, such as AWS and Azure, in, in much less hops than going through other, other providers out there in the marketplace. This, is, this slide here just talks a little bit around our visibility. So I talked about our ability to see uh, or our, how much internet traffic we, we see on, on the global internet. Um, if you look at, if, as I say, some of the research institutes out there um, have put our levels of internet traffic at over 50%. So at any given time, the level three backbone, AS3356, carries over 50% of global internet traffic. And that means we actually see a lot of events at any given moment in time. We're, you know, we're collecting around 140 billion NetFlow sessions a day. We are actively tracking around 15,000 command and controls. Command and control servers are essentially behind botnet activity. Um, botnet activity could be used either to control botnets which are involved in um, crypto jacking or more commonly um, involved in, in launching DDoS attacks. We're one of the largest DNS resolvers um, and we actively mitigate um, around about 120 DDoS attacks a day. We have a, a, a range of services to help our customers um, continue with their, their business operations. So with that in mind and what we see on the global internet, um, we have turned a lot of that intelligence into a range of services. Um, some of it provides intel for our customers, but some of it, some of it actually um, filters down into actually managed security offerings. We have our threat intelligence services, which feed into all of our security port into all of our security services. We have a host of logging, uh, monitoring, and analytics solutions, which fall into our security log monitoring pillar. Uh, we provide business continuity services by helping our customers protect their networks against DDoS attacks. And finally, we have a host of services which ultimately help our customers' perimeters and and and, and networks. Uh, we do a range of um, firewall services from dedicated firewall services to cloud-based firewall services and unified threat management platforms. So I talked a little bit around um, our perimeter security services. So most of our customers who consume services from us, um, internet services from us, either from us or from any other carrier out there, need to protect those internet connections. And those internet connections can be protected in a, a number of different ways. The three main ways that we provide and help our customers with is one, um, they could deploy a SD-WAN device, which has some basic security features on there. Our, our view is that um, a lot of our customers have uh, multiple different types of environments and quite often the deployment of security solutions tends to be a more of a hybrid approach. Um, so there are some instances where SD-WAN security could be um, the suitable way to go forward. However, the technology within SD-WAN devices tends to, tends to be fairly new um, and there is a market perception that there might be better, better ways of securing customers' internet than just purely SD-WAN. However, SD-WAN is purely, purely interoperable with our other security solutions. Other, other security solutions that we provide are what uh, is fairly mature in the market where we can provide dedicated managed um, firewalls of a host of different technologies where at your headquarters or your remote locations or your major branch offices, we would manage uh, security firewalls for you. The environment that we believe would be of significant um, value to our customers, including NGOs, is, is our cloud-based firewall service, which we branded Adaptive Network Security, which essentially is a centrally managed um, unified threat management platform. It consists of a, a variety of 
of different services which I'm going to run through with you now. But essentially what you are doing is you are moving the dedicated premise firewall that would sit at the end of your internet connection into the cloud. And you can consume that through a number of different ways. We will, we will talk you through some of the use cases in terms of how can that, that can be accessed over IPsec, uh, it can be accessed over, over MPLS and so forth. Um, but essentially what we've done, we've built a range of gateways around the globe. We have around about 31, which are constantly being evolved. And it's a, it's a, it's a platform that allows our customers to scale where they need, don't need to worry about um, patching or upgrading the service. It's a, you know, a constantly scalable solution that we are constantly up, updating and upgrading for our customers. So to give you a, an overview of what our actual platform consists of, um, the gateways that we have around the globe, it's essentially a, a next generation firewall. Um, it's a highly available service. Um, we don't believe in talking about vendors. Uh, at the end of the day, customers want services. They want a service. They want to know that they're going to have resiliency. They're going to have connectivity. They're going to have the security and protection. Um, so really, the, the platform is built on Fortinet, but we are looking to migrate and expand on that as time goes on. Some of the other features and functions that we provide for our customers, we provide IPS and IDS. Uh, it's all part and standard that you would find on, on Fortinet technology. We provide content and URL filtering for our customers. We provide anti-malware and sandboxing. So we would uh, allow these features to be added if required, where we would quarantine, um, say, an attachment, open it in a safe environment. Um, and if there was no issue, we would release it to, to, your, to your user. We can provide things like application and control where we can integrate um, your Active Directory so you can control applications down to the user level. We are developing um, technologies around data loss prevention. So you are, if you store credit card details, there are things we can do to tag those bits of data and we can alert you if, if that data does leave your network. And the other area which is significant is mobility. So we've added a component of mobility where uh, organizations can download um, a bit of software onto their device, be it an iPhone or laptop, and they can securely connect back onto their network knowing that they have the same security policies as users that are sitting in their headquarters or, or branch locations. So that is the security uh, feature set of adaptive network security. We have built these um, mainly where our customers tend to um, operate and have offices, but we are constantly expanding on this. Our vision was to have them around the globe and we are, we are con constantly building more um, as our, our customer base increases. Um, we have a set of security operation centers and we have around about 31 gateways around the globe. That's all backed up with other services that we do. We have security log monitoring ingestion platforms. We have um, hosted security environments, which are dedicated. And we have DDoS scrubbing centers for customers who want business uh, continuity for their platforms. So that gives you at a high level sort of what the feature set of our ANS platform is. Um, at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Graham, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about some use cases around uh, how we how we can deploy these and, and and sort of the architecture architecture examples. Thanks, Saud. Um, hi, Graham Smith. Uh, I look after the uh, security solutions side of, of the uh, Centre of the Gamia, Gamia business, uh, and I'll talk around some of the use cases that we that we, we typically see. Uh, first thing. You know, there's, there's no single answer to security. You know, every vendor out there will tell you that if you buy their technology, you don't need anybody else's. It solves the problem. Uh, the, the, the cloud web, gate, gate, web gateway vendors will say that. You don't need anything else. Just buy our cloud web gateway. Uh, the SD1 vendors will say similar. The, the traditional security uh, device vendors will say the same thing. The reality is it's not true. Um, depending on what type of connectivity needs you have and depending on where you're actually Kind of position your data is it in the cloud is it a mix is it in a data center is it on, on laptop devices you actually need to go for a more hybrid approach and that hybrid approach could be a mixture of various devices so it could be um you know i want to mix my connectivity up between raw internet 
SD1 across the internet, MPLS. I need to uh, position my data in Office 365. Uh, I need a, a, a private cloud solution in a data center, or I may be even passing the data off to a bureau. And then based upon that, you then arrive at the, the pieces of security you need to deploy to make that work, whether it be a, a mixture of public cloud firewall, network firewall, process firewall, SD1, whatever. Uh, do you want to just fly the next slide then, please, Saud? Saud, can I have the next slide, please? I am just trying to get that to move. There we are. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I just want to look at, at some typical firewall deployments out there. Uh, so the very first one, the managed premise firewall services, the very traditional style of approach that everybody will tell you is dead uh, in, in that you will put a firewall at every location you've got uh, and then you connect them all up to the public internet. There you go. That's, that's my traditional type of approach. And, and many of you may have solutions like that and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And, you know, even, even today I see lots of customers wanting to do that. And, and, the, and the reason being quite simply, you know, they deploy the security where it's required. It can do everything there. It might have downsides around um, having to manage policy across a lot of devices, but it's effective. It works. Um, the next type of approach, which again has been very popular for many years, is, is, is going for the kind of secure internet gateway type of approach where you'll use a, a, a set of devices at a single central location or a couple of central locations and, and plumb all the networks into there and, and use that as a breakout point. And, and again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that approach. Uh, it, it's, it's effective. It does the job. For some organizations, it doesn't make a lot of sense because of you know, the way they buy connectivity. But if you have private connectivity, it's a good way of doing it. it keeps all your policies centralized. Adaptive network security kind of jumps into the middle of this. So what adaptive network security allows you to do is effectively take the deployment model that suits you. So straight away, if you're an organization that's it's typically buying low cost internet connectivity in a particular location and region, and you don't want to put security devices on the end, then the immediate option you have with adaptive network security is you connect to ANS across the internet at, via an IPsec VPN from the router you've bought, uh, and effectively you can break out at the, at, at the adaptive network security gateway instead of breaking out at the local internet. Uh, good way of doing it. Uh, it's, it's a quick and easy way of building a, 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 an IP, uh, effectively a, a VPN across the internet and keeps all your risks centralized in the sense that the gateway acts as the security endpoint. Uh, another approach you can take here as well is, is to uh, mix and match it a bit. If you've got a private network and you've got low cost connectivity in certain regions, you can use it to mesh the private connectivity and the internet connectivity together into a bigger global web. So that's, that's, a, that's a good use for that type of, of, of service. Um, again, obviously you could go the SD-WAN route and achieve the same thing, but then you would end up with, uh, uh, you would end up with distributed security rather than a centralized security model. Um, again, none of these options are, are out the window. Vendors will tell you that, it, that, that uh, these solutions have died. I can tell you now, we still build as many secure gateways now as we ever did. Uh, it, it's just really what suits certain customers. Do you want to slide to the next slide, please, Sound? Just give me a sec, Graham. Okay. There we go. Okay, so, so a little bit more about adaptive network security and why, why it fits really well. It's not the replacement to anything. It's part of the puzzle that you put together. So if, if, we, if we look at the, the typical scenario on this, on this diagram here, you know, you come along, you may have SD-WAN, you may have raw internet, uh, you may have an MPLS network, um, you know, your data may reside in Google, it might reside in AWS, it might reside in Office 365, it might reside in all of them. Uh, you might also have a, a data center or a third party that stores data for you. You need a solution to all these things. And, and, and how do you go about solving all these problems with one technology? Well, well, you can't do it with one technology, but you can bridge the gap. So in a scenario where you had all these things together, you could well turn around and say, well, you know, 
the, the, the cloud web gateway, uh, public uh, web gateway vendors are telling me their technology solves everything, but we, we all know it doesn't because it's web. So anything that's not HTTP, HTTPS, they're not dealing with that. Uh, the SD-WAN vendor will tell you that oh, we can handle all this, but actually, can I get the performance out of that SD-WAN device to actually achieve everything? Probably not. So I kind of left a little bit uh, less there. And, and I probably don't really want to have a security policy across 30, 50, 100 sites. So, so how do I solve that problem? And that's where adaptive network security comes in because it sits there as the kind of centralized piece of glue. You know, in a, in a world where you've, you've gone for a predominantly SD1 type of approach, we, act as, we can act as an internet drain so you don't have to have security and security policy on every single device. We just act as a central point. So the internet just becomes a transport. If you've got uh, an MPLS network, we can act as the, 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 the single private network drain for all, all the customers as well. And that doesn't mean to say you can't use a, a, a public cloud web gateway, you know, a, a, a Zscaler, a Cisco Umbrella, a, a Force Point, whatever, you absolutely can. What we then do is give you the ability to transact with that service in a secure manner. So, you know, we can, we can effectively extend the likes of Zscaler out as being another site on your network so you can securely send your requests to them without danger of uh, traffic being intercepted or, or, or um, uh, interfered with in any way. Uh, and then moving to the remote user space, you know, bringing that all together from there, the user that's actually out and about and not ac got access to your site, you can bring them in via remote access and give them access to exactly the same services as everybody else. So that's, that's the beauty of adaptive network security. It doesn't replace any piece, but it, 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 it's a multi-protocol stack. So everything the cloud web gateway can't do, it can provide. It doesn't attempt to take over what the cloud web gateway can do, although it can provide those services. But if you want it to interoperate with it, it's absolutely fine as well. Uh, and we get lots of customers to do that. So, so that, that in, a, in, a, in a complete piece is adaptive network security. And that kind of finishes our piece of the presentation side. Great, fantastic. So, um, yeah, hopefully that gave you a good overview. Um, I guess we've got a fair bit of time to cover off sort of any, any Q&A uh, on that. But that sort of give you an overview of sort of the product set, um, what the feature set of the, of the service was, uh, and some kind of use cases in terms of how it can be deployed. Um, for you know headquarters, branch sites, uh, and also incorporate uh, mobile users. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, Graham and I are happy to happy to field them. Thanks very much, Graham and Sal. And yeah, we have got a, a few questions coming in, so I'm I'm going to ask um, a few of them, but please please keep them coming in, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll try and include everything. Um, so yeah. Uh, a question about the uh, whether whether there's any performance um, hit or improvement from using ANS for uh, for, for end users. Okay, and and is there a, a specific use case that we want to talk to around that? Uh, I haven't got one in the question. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll we'll just take a general. Well, I'll I'll take it from various angles. Um, so. So if you were looking at it against uh, uh, perhaps a, an SD1 style deployment where you're using a device, uh, a kind of an SD1 device trying to use it for that and security, then you've got an immediate benefit if you're using the full UTM stack. The, the, the downside of, of SD1, for instance, is, is you're scaling that device to, to do a networking feature. And as soon as you start loading it up with security features that need to do lots of inspection, you're going to get a performance hit. So that's one of the benefits of of, a, of an SD, of, a, of an adaptive network security in that scenario, because you're just offloading all that. You're just saying, yeah, you just get the tunnel, you get the data to us, we'll do all the heavy lift processing. The advantage you have in terms of adaptive network security is it's an ASIC based solution in the sense that all the cryptography, as long as it's not really high end type stuff, will get offloaded to, to a separate processor. So, so we really can scale these boxes up to, to ridiculous levels. Uh, for, yep. for, for the for the the, the endpoint that I mean there, there are there are there is hardware at the at the location um, providing the, uh, the access to the system. Um, have you you got any kind of um, information about sort of prerequisites and requirements for that, um, so that uh, members would be able to evaluate what they've already got in place? Um. 
Sorry, I'm not. Uh, you mean in terms of what you need to do to, yeah, to yeah, onboard so, adaptive yeah. security? What, what do you need uh, in order to, to, to get going? Right, okay. So, adaptive network security, I mean, assuming you haven't bought a, a, an IP VPN, and we'll, and we'll assume for the purpose of this we haven't, and, and we're working from some kind of internet connectivity basis, mm -hmm. the only thing you require to connect to adaptive network security is effectively the ability to, to form a secure IPsec tunnel. Uh, so there's a there's a there's a set of standards we don't drop below because because below that set you start to get into quite dangerous ground about how reliable a cryptography is. Yes, but yes. but but you know as long as you can step up to at least AS AS one twenty eight, you know, and you know, and okay, e and, so and you, operate a pre shared key, you, you're aware. So so um, probably going beyond consumer grade equipment. Um, but would you be able to use this from um, using the built-in VPN capabilities of, say, Windows or? or oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, we're, yeah, we're not talking about high-end cryptography these days. We're just talking about cryptography that is actually reasonably effective. So, you know, AES AES one twenty eight is is you know pretty much in everything out there. Um, so, so we don't have a problem usually about adopting that stuff. We just dropped some of the earlier. Uh, cryptography because it's it's fairly useless now you know the, yep. the scale of your even a, a domestic computer is probably enough to crack most of it so so we kind of keep away from that um so 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 really strictly yeah i mean pre-shared as long as you can deliver a pre-shared key and as to 120 at minimum you're away with us it's not a problem okay i got um kim um has provided a bit more context to her question um about client performance um so the yeah, the, the the case that she's thinking of Say um, you have a client located in China and it's traversing the public internet to access a financial application hosted in Virginia in the US. Um, if, if we were to switch from that to using ANS, would there be any performance benefits? Okay. Uh Whenever you mention China, there's a million questions I've got in my head <laughs> around, around how it's probably working. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll you know how we would probably do it we would probably terminate that connection from your site probably into our hong kong gateways and, and out from there so you would probably find we actually have good peering connectivity that in via that route so that's pretty good uh to answer the question properly i'd have to ask a lot of questions but i would i would expect you would i would expect you wouldn't suffer any performance penalty and i would expect you would see an improvement just simply because of our network connectivity in that region and, and for locations that are um, a bit distant, perhaps from some of the points you had on your map, um, say um, we have people, you know, places, people working in South Africa or Nigeria or um, you know, Colombia in, in South America. I mean, how? Yeah. Well, are, are there any are there any performance benefits for them? So, I mean, I guess you, there's lots of there's lots of things that you need to consider about that, but we do have um, ANS gateways in, in South Africa, um, and we do have um, ANS gateways that are due to launch in, in South America as well. I think really, you know, the nature of the internet is, say you have a, a, a user in, in Nigeria, they would, they would probably interconnect into our, into our Johannesburg gateway. And once they get to our Johannesburg gateway, well, that's sitting on our global backbone. You are one hop away. Um, from a lot of our partners, um, you know, that's sitting on a, essentially the back end of our ANS platform is a MPLS network. Um, so as soon as you hit that Johannesburg gateway, um, the performance should be should be fairly good. I guess it would be getting across Africa and what the peering agreements agreements would be between you know the local Nigeria Nigerian ISP and 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 our and our uh, connectivity in Johannesburg. It could be a case that we are peering directly. Um, we won't always be, but that's that's just the nature of nature of the internet. Um, for 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 a um, for 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 a, a customer of yours that was already you know was committed to using ANS, and if they were um, making a decision about what ISP to use in different location, you would be able to advise them on. Yeah, on absolutely. Yeah, I mean we. we, we you know, it's, I mean, it's a source of public record where, where ISPs peer, but yes, we can certainly help customers make a decision on is a service provider in region a good choice for, for what they're trying to use. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, and another question that we had here, um, are all endpoints proxied? Um, 
and by endpoints, I think this is a question from Dan Carr at CRS. Um, I think by endpoints, are you thinking, are you saying your question was answered? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, maybe we'll uh, we'll skip to another uh, uh, another question. Um, okay, um, do you provide an early warning service that helps customers better prepare for emerging threats? That's, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we absolutely do. So whilst we've been talking about our secure internet gateway service, which is um, otherwise known as adaptive networks, what we bring to the, to the cyber landscape in the market is our, is our visibility on the global network. And we do have um, threat intelligence services uh, where we are sampling our own backbone. We are also taking a whole load of other threat feeds. We do, we collect over, 100 terabytes of metadata every day that's headers uh, of where traffic's coming from where traffic's going to we have a significant data lake of information around ip and dns information around who the bad actors are, are out there um, so we do provide services uh, subscription services um, which can allow customers to begin to proactively uh, funnel and understand who is talking to their network uh, and infrastructure um, so happy to have a conversation, uh, a further conversation around those, those services. Okay. And um, if, if a customer finds themselves under attack, something that's, um, that, that's, that's got through the security, is this something that um, they, could, they could bring on your expertise to, uh, to, to, to help tackle while it's going on? So, so we, 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 let's take it as a, a customer that's buying our, our connectivity security services right now would obviously get access to our SOC. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the SOC, th there's lots of threats you can see. So, so you can, you know, some, some threats will be things like, you know, a distributed denial of service attack against your assets that are connected to us. Um, sometimes it's uh, um, somebody uh, uh, assuming the identity of, of, of some of your sites or assets as well. So some of them are, are kind of, completely free services you know we have a we have a computer emergency response team like all large telecommunications organizations you know we've we've helped customers in the past perform takedowns of of uh bad actors based on that we do that as part of our service going forward anyway you know i think sarah mentioned you know the number of c2 servers we take down off the network kind of off, off our own initiative so to speak so so yeah absolutely i mean we have services there our ddos services are available to buy we have an emergency version of that service for a customer that needs to get it on board quickly um all, all sorts of, of of elements but i mean when a customer is buying something like adaptive network security and they and, and they come under attack for something inside there then the SOC will work with them to try and resolve that issue okay okay and um obviously you you mentioned that um You've you've got a huge data lake of, uh, of 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 information about attacks and a great a great deal of experience around that. Is this something that um, is only available to your customers, or do you do, um, do you do you share this with the community at large? So, so do you want me to pick this one out? Yeah. Yeah, I'll have it for you to yeah. take that one. Yeah. So, so so we have information alliances with 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 other information gatherers gatherers out there. We, you know, we we work together to supply intel and they supply us intel and it allows us all to enrich our data set so so we absolutely are part of sharing alliances where we where we share the data we get um, as i say we've got a computer emergency response team they're sharing data with other certs around the world as well because you know it's it's not about competitive edge in that space it's all about helping each other make the internet a, a, a safer place so we all work together to do that so we absolutely do share in that respect uh, another initiative we are working on right now is how to make all that data actionable so how can we build that into our products to actually allow customers using those products to take advantage of that data in the sense of being able to immediately use our our list of known c2 urls to make sure traffic doesn't you know, you, you, you can't accidentally start talking to these things. So they're the kind of key, key areas. Yes, we absolutely share data and we're absolutely looking about how we can leverage that data to actually make our, our services a lot more secure for customers. Yeah, and, and just to elaborate on that, absolutely. I mean, we have services which, you know, we know our customers don't always have to buy our network. We are carrier agnostic. We can provide a whole host of services where we can help customers understand their environment. We can, you know, uh, ingest logs uh, of, of various various devices and provide a whole load of sort of threat anal analytics tools and and outsourced security operation center type services um, specific for our customers. That's all part part of what we do as a 
as a managed security services provider. Great, thanks. Um, a slight change of uh, of of um, the area of the subject. So, um, at the moment, the NetHope members will make use of the features on their firewalls um, much beyond security, um, and it's very common to use them to optimize performance of internet connections shared by staff in remote locations where the internet connections are a bit um, a bit shaky. Um, features such as traffic shaping and quality of service are really, really popular. Um, does ANS offer this kind of functionality uh, in the cloud? Am I taking this or are you taking this, sir? Shall I take it? Uh, yeah, you take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we offer, we offer some traffic shaping features uh, in all our products. Uh, it depends which ones you want to use, which, which ones will work. The ones we have to be a little bit careful with are the ones that affect MTU. So we have to be a little bit careful about which features we turn on for that side because that can actually cause problems. But, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, a firewall feature set performance type tool set is, is, is fairly common. Uh, I take it we're not tra talking about anything that's trying to use uh, IPsec quasi. We're just talking about simple, you know, application control. But yes, we can do that. Yeah, okay, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, no, that's a, that standard IP um, TCP uh, quasi is, uh, is, is 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 hugely popular. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I could I could imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, if you go yeah. back to many years ago, compressed stack on the router on the on the router network was the was the first thing everybody turned on to try and get around the fact that their internet connections were really. Yeah, really absolutely, and, and 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 with uh, with NGOs being a bit um, budgetary constrained, um, and and also the locations where they're operating, things often aren't very uh, are very optimal. We, we, we try to do as much as we can to uh, to get the most value out of yeah, yeah exactly yeah exactly what we have. So you know, if your service offers that, then um, it's uh, yeah that's definitely a valuable feature. Um, I wonder also whether um, you provide uh, insight into how the the connectivity is uh, is being used in each location. Do you um, do you, do you yeah. have to do kind of reporting? We do. So one of the things I guess we didn't we didn't cover on this, but yeah, the the reporting uh, we use uh, analytics security analytics dashboard and and what you can uh, it's a it's a real time dashboard that you get as part of the service. Uh, and essentially, you, you can see bandwidth utilization and you, you can see lots of statistics on, uh, on you know, attacks and, and, and so forth um, on, on your adaptive network security platform. So, yeah, there is, there is information in real time on, on your ingress and egress traffic on your gateways. Um, what we don't do because they're shared um, mm. is go down to site level. Yes. But if certain sites are consuming, say, a gateway in, say, Johannesburg, they will be able to see utilization on that on that gateway. Okay. Um, so it does give you that level of granularity. And okay, though that's that's great. Um, and um, how how could people have a, a look and see what these uh, what the features are and what the interface looks like? Um, how, how do people see? Yeah. So, so the interface itself, we do have um, we do have user guides. Um, what I would urge people to do um, at the end of this um, webinar is um, there is a landing page, um, a security landing page. Within that, we have uh, adaptive network security. Um, there are data sheets within that, but there is a, a fairly good comprehensive guide we have for our customers, which gives a, gives a view of what the what the interface and, and portal looks like. Um, we are trying to move to make it as automated as possible. Um, they will be uh, on our roadmap. There is a vision to try and get that uh, to be as self-service as we can get it. At this time, if you need to make changes, uh, you need to have an interaction with our security operations center and we have an SLA around it. Fantastic, fantastic. And then of, of course, people um, are asking around uh, costs and charging models. So what, what is the charging model? Is it, is it based on the site? Um, so, by the number of users, by the volume transferred, how? Yeah, so we actually got a, a fairly um, telco approach in terms of how we decided to charge this. Most of the uh, most of our uh, competition like to charge per user, but actually we decided that wasn't a very good mechanism. Um, we a number of the number of users or the number of devices are, are, are largely irrelevant for us. The way we tend to put together a model would be. 
um, it's, it's on bandwidth. So how many megabits per second of bandwidth would you be utilizing in our gateways? And the other benefit we've also done is because we are a global provider, we've, we've essentially provided flat rate pricing around the globe. So be it you, your, your users be in Latin America, Asia Pac, or in the United States, um, we can offer flat rate pricing for our ANS gateways. And, and is this is this billed on a monthly or annual basis? It's a it's a service, so we can bill it. Um, we typically tend to bill our customers on a on a uh, a, a, a monthly uh, basis. But if, if 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 it's required to be billed quarterly or annually, we can we can arrange that. And, um, and it's a flat rate charge, and it's not it's not utilization based. It's you would set a bandwidth limit on the gateway. You can monitor that bandwidth utilization using the portal. Um, and if you needed to make changes, obviously you can up upgrade or, or downgrade that service, but it would be a fixed monthly charge. And, and, and could we, could we um, have, have the billing for, for different sites based on the bandwidth that they set or is it? Is it yeah, we could break it down. Yep. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, we could break it down into different, into different regions if, if that was a requirement for the customer. That's fantastic. Um, and um, I think a, a, a last a last question, really. Um, yeah, uh, pe people are quite in intrigued about how um, how it might be used by um, by people that are on the road. So once they're outside of um, outside of a, 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 an NGO office, um, what how would they access the service from their phones or from their laptops? Right, so so you you've basically got two options. Uh, you can you can go with a, a a VPN client effectively and just install it. So if you're on your laptop, you could put a VPN client in, and then you know choose what mechanism uh, of authentication you want to use. You connect to the service, uh, and effectively you you're just part of the the central network. So you can just do that. You can just use it as a remote client. On a mobile device, it really depends on. On, on how you want to go down that route because you're probably likely to go more more down an SSL landing page type of approach for a for a device like that. Uh, and, and and like more services we offer the, the kind of the range of using SSL as a transport, using SSL as a as a connectivity mechanism uh, to for for a, a wide variety of devices. Again, that becomes quite custom because how people want that to work tends to be quite personal to them. You know, some customers want to do some checking of the of the device. Some customers don't want to do any checking of the device. Uh, it, it it's really up to them on how they want to utilize that. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. But you would be able to provide guidance around the different options. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, using a client's quite standard. There's nothing particularly exciting about it. You know, you, you use it. You probably just most the most interesting thing is what authentication method you're going to use is probably about as far as it goes. It's been around for a long time. Uh, clientless is, is, is more of a personal topic to a customer. There isn't really two ways different customers do use the same mechanism. Everybody wants their own kind of personal feel on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I think, again, we're getting towards the, uh, the, the, the end of the hour. Um, and I found this super, super fascinating and I'm, I'm sure um, our attendees have as well. Um, I didn't do notice that uh, Madeline has kindly posted a couple of links um, into the chat windows um, where you can uh, you can click on them to find out a bit more information about this product. Um, and there's also the threat research report. There's a link to the 2019 threat research report. I wonder if you just want to sort of give people a little bit of an introduction to, to what that is and why they should click the link. Again, yeah, should I, I grab that or you, so? Yeah, uh, I can I can run it through. Okay. So it's, yeah, essentially what we do on a on a yearly basis. I mean, obviously we we have a huge amount of visibility on the global network as a global ISP. So we have, uh, over the course of the last few years, we have been focusing on uh, a threat report. It, it tends to focus around um, botnet activity and, and DDoS attacks. That's our that's our kind of um, our strength. Um, but you know, there's some key takeaways within that report. Um, it talks a little bit about some of the actions that organizations can, can do and uh, off the back of what, what we're seeing on the global network and some of the trends and some of the bad actors um, that we're seeing. Um, so it's, uh, it's not one of those reports which are like 200 pages long. It's about sort of 18 or 19 pages. So it's uh, fairly, fairly to the point. Yeah, the, the, the interesting stuff is not in the headlines. You know, the, the fact that attacks are getting bigger, bigger, more frequent and more sophisticated, you shouldn't be surprised by that. 
But if you read beyond that to see what's going on behind the scenes, that's where it becomes much more interesting around insight. And I won't spoil the read. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, well, Tubbs, thank you ever so much um, for, 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 for sharing with us today. Um, I found, found that very um, useful. Um, and I'm sure that we'll have some follow-up questions which we can share um, in the meantime. And uh, see um, your, uh, your contact details are on there, so attendees are able to get uh, directly in, in touch with you. So yeah, thank you once again um, for your time today. Um, and thank you everybody who, uh, who attended. Um, at the, uh, at, at, as we close this webinar, um, you'll be in, invited to fill out a short survey just to say like what you've thought of it in, um, uh, in, in general. Um, so yeah, please do fill that survey in. And I look forward to welcoming you back to a, uh, a, another Connectivity and Infrastructure NetHope webinar uh, in the near future. So th thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to everyone who attended today and for our speakers. Um, as Duncan mentioned, please fill out the uh, satisfaction survey. We appreciate your input and comments. And look for that follow-up email, which will include contact information for both Saud and Graham and links to the recording and other collateral. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.